Welcome everybody to this new episode of My Data Guest. Today's guest is Pedro Medina. Pedro is an expert in AI, automation, and analytics. Among all of those, he specialized in food analytics. He's the founder of Haystack Data Solution, a company that helps agri-food businesses to grow by analyzing their data. So today's interview is going to deal with a new business for us because we will talk with Pedro about data science for the food industry. Welcome, Pedro. Thank you, Rosaria. Thank you so much for having me. So your specialty is to use data science to improve food and beverage production. This is actually one of the fields I don't have much experience on. So before we start, maybe let's let's clarify one thing. How different is data analytics for the food industry with respect to all other flavors of data analytics, like, I don't know, for example, like finance? That's a great question. And I break down food analytics into three buckets. Uh, the first one is the standard business analytics. That's just like any other company. You know, that's you have the financial analytics, the sales and marketing analytics, those types of things. Uh, the second bucket is what I call industrial analytics. And that's really where things get uh, a lot more interesting for uh, myself and our, our developers, which is really getting into the production of food itself on the line, on the manufacturing line. And so that includes things like pulling data out of PLC systems, electromechanical servos, that type of data being produced on the actual manufacturing line. And then, then the third bucket is the food science. And that's an area that we don't work in at the moment. It's an area that we are interested in exploring, uh, but that's really more about uh, how food scientists help produce and develop and design uh, the food items that we eat and that we see in the grocery store every day, right? So experimenting with flavors, recipes, uh, and that could, that's an entirely different area of the food industry. So those are the three main buckets of food analytics as I see them. I see. So tell us a bit more about what it means to use data science to improve the production of food. Um, tell us more in basically about your profession. Absolutely. So the way we, in the first two buckets I mentioned, the way we interface with our clients, which happen to be primarily food manufacturers, food processors, and this can include anything from companies that uh, produce and manufacture baked goods, so industrial bakers, big bakers that produce thousands and thousands of uh, baked uh, items every day, uh, to confectionery manufacturers. These are candy makers, for example. Um, these are companies, the way that data science plays a key role for them is in doing everything from food quality, so analyzing food quality, um, production, so the output, the throughput, how optimized are your systems and your processes to get as much quality food out the door as possible every day. Uh, and then other areas you know, that we are getting into a lot more these days is sustainability. Sustainability in food manufacturing is huge. So reducing things like food waste, energy waste, um, you know, all of these things is how, and, and they have ultimately an impact on the bottom line of the company, right? So it's very important for them to be as efficient as possible. And data science ha plays a big part in that. So not only optimizing quality and quantity, but also waste. Exactly. Exactly. So they call that scrap in the industry. And so a lot of these manufacturers, they try to measure and track and analyze the root cause of that excess scrap. Every food manufacturer is always gonna generate food waste, um, but a lot of them are embracing sustainability measures that are trying to avoid landfills. So how do you repurpose food waste, You know, either as animal feed or many other things? Mm -hmm. So it's a very interesting and fast growing space right now that I see a lot of potential for both data science and NIME in particular to play a big part in. Interesting. So how's the food related data? Are those chemical data, classic sales data? That's a good question. And, you know, uh, going back to those buckets, uh, the business analytics, business intelligence side, like I said, is like any other business. And these are your standard, you know, ERP standard type data, formatted, structured data, transactional data that is kept in a data warehouse on the cloud, on premises in a database somewhere. Um, 
And, but when you start venturing into more of the food science, that's where you start to get into more things like bioinformatics, chemical mm -hmm. analytics. Uh, they're even doing genomics uh, these days. I so see. it's it's a very, very uh, advanced and technologically savvy uh, space of, of, of the food industry. I see, I see. Um, so do you work to, um, uh, we already talked about waste, uh, um, technology, production optimization, food quality, but do you work to improve quality, quantity, technology, costs? So what do you specialize on? That's a really good question. And to be honest, it's all of the above. Uh, when we work with cl our clients and to, to take a step back, our clients are primarily in that uh, mid-sized space. So they tend to be, you know, smaller to mid-sized companies who may not have the internal resources to produce some of these data solutions themselves. Um, and so what we do is really help them leverage their data to maximum impact. So what does that mean? That means things like integrating and blending data sources, which is, you know, nine plays a huge part in that. Uh, it means data quality. Uh, how do they clean their data up? How do they have structured data that, that is usable and repeatable? Um, and then, you know, insights. How do they leverage those insights out of that data? Once you have it integrated, blended, cleaned, ready to be analyzed, what we like to call in the data space rectangular data, um, you know, how do you then start to maximize the value that they get out of that data? Uh, so those are really the, the key areas that we see uh, in, in food manufacturing and in this space in particular as well. So um, um, all clear, So, but our audience likes examples. So if you can give us a practical example of, uh, um, you know, a process in the food industry where data science helps. That's a great question. So some projects that we have worked on, uh, for instance, right now, we just completed a big demand forecasting project for a food manufacturer. Uh, and demand forecasting for food is a incredibly important space. Why? Because more often than not, food is perishable, right? So uh, to go back to that example of the industrial baker, uh, this baker will produce thousands of, let's say, loaves of bread on a daily basis. That bread then gets shipped to grocery stores, mm -hmm. uh, you know, bake uh, smaller bakeries and so forth. That if they don't get it right, if they don't understand exactly what demand for their product is going to be, you can wind up with a lot of wasted food. Um, and so, and yeah. with wasted food goes all of the ingredients, the energy, the labor, everything that went into producing that food, all of that gets thrown away and gets wasted. So it, it's impacting their bottom line. So for companies like these, understanding demand, being able to forecast it accurately uh, is critically important. And one interesting thing to kind of un you know, help convey uh, the uniqueness of the food industry that customer data that helps you do a lot of that demand forecasting is typically not available to your typical food manufacturer. That is owned and controlled by the retailer, the grocery store, the food service, the restaurant, all of these. So that's very valuable data for these companies. Um, so there are companies that are dedicated to repurposing and selling that data. Uh, what we do is help these food manufacturers leverage the data that they already have to be able mm -hmm. to build these types of demand forecasts so that they don't need to go and buy or you know or, or not have visibility into what their customers want uh, when they want it. So that's very important for them. So demand forecasting is a big big example. I've got some others if you'd like to like to hear about those too. I see, I see. Um, we will have more questions later about some more examples. Um, so let's talk another big questions that our audience likes um, is about training and job. So do you need special training to work uh, uh, in the food industry? We already talked about some kind of marketing-like um, mm -hmm. jobs, and those, I guess, they are the same as every marketing-like jobs. But maybe for uh, the food science, you need some special training. That's exactly right. On the food science side, you definitely need to be a food scientist. Um, go to school for that. Get your degree in, in, in food science. I'm up here in Minnesota, uh, Twin Cities. Uh, and this is considered part of the breadbasket. They call it the breadbasket of America. So there's a lot of uh, food companies up here. You've got huge companies like Cargill and General Mills and, and a lot of others here locally. Uh, but the universities 
are also heavily involved in food, agriculture, all of these areas. And so food science is a big part of what is, you know, produced uh, here in the local universities. There's a lot of excellent food science programs here locally. So yes, on the food science, you definitely need to go to school for that. But just general data analytics, uh, no, if, if you're good with data, if you understand data science and the principles of data science, and you can work with data very well, uh, you should have no issues breaking into the industry that way. But, but then after you study either for data science or for food science, uh, what about the job situation? Uh, is the food industry on the look for data scientists? Uh, are, are they hiring? That's a great question. And, and the simple answer to that is yes. Uh, the food industry right now, from personal experience, they are lagging behind other industries in terms of their digital transformation, uh, their technological transformation. And in addition to that, there are also labor issues. So food manufacturers are having a very hard time finding people yeah. to work on these plants. And so wh why is that important? It's important because you need digital skills in order to not only provide the value that I described earlier, but also for automation. Automation in food manufacturing is taking off. Um, it, and it's, it comes in multiple flavors, and pardon the pun, but automation in, in, in food manufacturing includes robotics. So there's a lot of robots that are being deployed on manufacturing lines, simply because there's just not enough people to do that type of work. Uh, but one other area that we personally are heavily involved in is uh, robotic process automation, RPA as it's called. And that is about leveraging data, using software and data to automate processes and steps uh, in the food manufacturing process so that you don't need a human to be able to do that work if you can't find that human. So automation, um, analytics, these are very, very important for food manufacturing today. And so yes, the the, the short answer is, they are hiring and digital skills are going to be, I would say, a requirement in the next five to 10 years. So, yeah, it's going to be expected to get into the industry that way. So for the youngsters in our audience, get, get to study the data science more. So there are jobs uh, in the food industry as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's go back now to the examples. So you already talked about uh, demand forecasting. So um, what are other uh, common data science use cases uh, in your field? So I mentioned sustainability earlier. Um, there is a whole branch of data science that is focused on sustainability analytics or data science for sustainability. Um, I am, you know, I write a lot of content uh, articles uh, that try to explore that intersection of food manufacturing and sustainability and how data can play a, a big part in that. So that is one area that I am extremely excited about uh, both now and in the future is how can we leverage data and data science to not only upskill these workers, but also help these companies be able to track, measure, analyze, and gather impactful insights to reduce waste, reduce food waste, um, all of these things in order to, to feed a, a growing population, right? The, 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 the world population is going to increase to almost 10 billion people by the year 2050. In order to meet that demand, the food industry globally has to increase their food production by 60%. 60% yeah, that's from- That's a big challenge in the that future. That is an enormous challenge, absolutely. And the only way I see us getting there one of the ways that we we can do that is by leveraging data and technology. So that's going to play an, an, an enormous impact in the coming years. I see. Yeah, yeah. It's absolutely one of the uh, emerging challenges for the future, also with the climate change. Um, Definitely. The whole, uh, yeah, the whole food uh, industry, the food chain is going to change completely. Absolutely. And that's a great point you mentioned because, you know, supply chain, another area. So to, to speak of another use case, supply chain analytics is another area that is extremely, extremely in, in demand right now. So everything that we just experienced from the pandemic, so how supply chains collapsed. Now we have, uh, you know, a, a war impacting the food supply, driving up the cost of food, inflation, 
these are all things that are making food more expensive and less accessible for people all around the world. So how do you address that? How do you start leveraging the tools that you currently have right now and the tools that you need to begin developing into the future to be able to feed a growing population and be able to feed the world and to do so sustainably without damaging the environment, right? So those are all very important things. Right. Um, so let's go back to the technology. I have a question that I rarely ask, but since uh, you are an expert in that, I would like to ask you. So what about Alteryx and Nibe? Great question. I, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely very opinionated here. So having been a former NIME par uh, Alteryx partner, excuse me, um, I have been, I have fallen in love with NIME. I think what, you know, when you compare, as I like to say, why pay for Alteryx when NIME doesn't cost a dime, right? So I tell that to all of my clients, at least a desktop tool, right? So um, and the NIME server is also very affordable as well. So I see enormous opportunities here for drag and drop low code data science to provide those types of digital <clears throat> skills that we talked about in the industry, in this industry, and in really, frankly, every industry. Um, as I said, having been a, a former Alteryx partner, I, you know, feel that NIME is much more suited to advanced data science. I think it actually is gets closer to code uh, than does Alteryx. Uh, I mean, even just the sheer number of nodes. So NIME has what, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's getting close to 4,000 nodes by now. If, yeah, um, if I'm, so what, what does that mean? Yes, it's, it's drag and drop, but it's drag and drop at a much more granular level. So what does that mean? It gives you more flexibility. You can build solutions that uh, you know, would only uh, other people would have to, you know, program out using code, which takes much longer to do, uh, is much more costly. But drag and drop, that's what I that's why I love NIME. It's, it's, it's drag and drop, meaning you can have a minimally viable product to the customer in days versus months. And that is an enormous, that's a game changer as far as I'm, as I'm, as I'm aware, as, as I'm concerned. So we really need to drive awareness of NIME and, and get the word out. So yeah, I'm a big fan, as you can tell. <laughs> I, I'm not going to stop you. <laughs> <laughs> I can keep talking all day. I, I, uh, I don't know if you saw a recent blog post, but I, uh, I, you know, posted a, an image of the Nime logo with a heart around it, and that's just, uh, <laughs> that's just absolutely. how I feel about it. I think I, I absolutely love Nime, and I think, and I'm really behind uh, the mission to democratize data science. And I think low code is the way to go uh, to get there. So yeah, big fan. Great, great comment. Okay, so let's go back to the more technical side. So let's talk about how. Uh, you use NIME. So if you use it for, you talked about uh, demand forecasting. So do, does it help more in data preparation? Uh, do you work more with the machine learning part? That's a great, great question. I think that one of the key use cases from, you know, in our experience is NIME's ability to blend multiple data sources, regardless of where it lives. So, you know, as I said, many of our clients are early in terms of their data science maturity. So they have, you know, we call it Excel hell. There's millions of Excel spreadsheets all over the company. Uh, it's very hard to understand where the data comes from. It's very hard to un see the logic that goes into that data that's in rows and columns in a spreadsheet. So what we do is that we help them modernize their analytics essentially. And one of the key ways we do that is to we extract that logic out of out of these spreadsheets so that it's no longer buried in cells and rows and columns you now see it visually it is visually documented in a visual workflow in nime on the nime canvas so you read it from left to right top to bottom it's very clear to see what logic and the thinking that went into producing those metrics that analyses those numbers so and it's also very easy to train people so as you are onboarding new workers in your food manufacturing company, you can easily say, look, here's a nine workflow, understand it, consume it, and now you can quickly pick it up and continue producing and, 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 and analyzing data. Whereas when you're dealing with you know, a million different spreadsheets, it's much harder, it, the spreadsheets are much more brittle 
And essentially, they should not be, spreadsheets should not be your primary data source and analytics platform, in our opinion. We think that NIME is the perfect tool to be that sort of intermediary between the analysts on one side and the data scientists on the other. And sure, spreadsheets are not going to go away. I mean, I think, I think spreadsheets are great. They're useful. They have their place for ad hoc analyses and that sort of thing. But for repeatable, you know, consistent output of your analytics that can be used by everyone throughout the company, I think that's where NIME's sweet spot really is and the difference that it can make. So uh, that's, that's one way we use it. The data blending to add, to answer your question succinctly is blending multiple data sources and and you know just to, to 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 add a little bit to what I just said we have a name for this we call this analytics process automation APA and that's where I think Nime really <laughs> thrives is is in that sort of analytics process automation. Perfect. Okay, so but um, can you take us through a concrete example where Nime has helped has changed the game? Absolutely. Um, going back to this demand forecast project we we just completed, uh, this was a client who we actually, you know, when we started engaging with them, uh, entirely spreadsheet based. We transitioned them onto Nime. Initially, we started off just simple workflows on the desktop, but as the sophistication grew and grew over time, it made sense to adopt Nime server in order to automate these analyses and automate these workflows and these jobs so that they just run every day consistently. And what we did is that we converted that demand forecast into an app on the NIME server. So now we are able to connect directly to their production system. Uh, and we are able to measure on a daily basis how much of that food product they're producing. And then we're able to leverage and predict out into the future what they're likely to produce next week, next month, next year. Uh, and then this is valuable information, not just for the data scientists, but this is valuable for the leadership, for the sales teams, for everyone. So how do you get that those insights out? Uh, so we find that the best way to do that is to use the NIME server. So you build an app on NIME server. It's already incorporating that model. And now you're able to share in a very easy, user-friendly, intuitive way where you just have, you know, uh, you know, you're able to click through, you're able to, you know, you have slider bars, you're able to do these sorts of what if scenarios on the fly with the data and with that model. And that's incredibly powerful for our clients and customers. So that's one example of how, you know, we're leveraging NIME and NIME server and, and the kind of impact that it can have to an organization, not just in the food industry, but really in, in every industry. Great. So now that we talked about the NIME server, I would like to ask you a question about deployment. So I uh, always tell this story uh, that I was once at a conference that was before COVID, before we, when we used to go to, go to conference. Um, so I was distrib I had some magnet tiles and we, we distributed them, you know, at the booth. And uh, we had four types of tiles and one type was uh, data access, then another one was data transformation, then we had model training, and then we had deployment. And I remember that, you know, we had all of them spread out on the booth and nobody, nobody took deployment, nobody. And there was a guy, I tried to give him the <laughs> deployment tile and he said, no, 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 it hurts. <laughs> So I don't know what what's about deployment. Why is it such a tricky part of the data science life cycle? Absolutely, as you know, as we like to say, deployment is a dirty word in, in, in data <laughs> science, unfortunately. And I and I've and I've heard this said somewhere. I, I wish I can attribute uh, where who said this, but in, and it's in, and it's one hundred percent correct. Um, and the way I see it is that in software engineering. You know, the software engineer only needs to worry about the code. Uh, in machine learning engineering and data science, you need to worry about the code and the data. Uh, but in in data science itself, you have to worry about all three. You have to worry about the code, the data, the you know, the 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 the, 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 the deployment, all of that. And so, what is it? It's just, just a layer of complexity that keeps building on top of each other. And it's very, very difficult to deploy that. You have to worry about the model. You have to worry about the data. You have to worry about the code. Um, and then to add to that com already complex process, business logic 
itself is always shifting, right? So today you define something like this and tomorrow is going to be defined elsewhere. So you have to be very agile and flexible in terms of your model development, you know, uh, working with stakeholders across the organization and making sure that there's alignment in terms of how the data is being interpreted and, and, and defined. So all of that makes taking what you've built and deploying it into production incredibly difficult, A, to do, and B, to maintain. So yeah. that's why I think there's a big opportunity in the data science space for someone who can figure out a way to r remove the friction out of the deployment process. So I think that's I think there's going to be big opportunities there uh, in in the future. Um, but I uh, you know I also going back to Nime, one way that I think Nime is helping address that pain is through you know its its use of PMML right. So predictive modeling markup language. That's a good bridge right. So you're able it's essentially for those who don't know it's an XML standard where you're able to have um, you know different pieces of software uh, consume a predictive model uh, from one to the other, right? So it's a great way of sort of reducing that friction, as I mentioned before. Um, but unfortunately, from my personal experience, and at least in, in 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 the world that I navigate in, very few companies know what PMML is. Very even fewer actually use it. And I think that there is some opportunity there. But, uh, you know, in, in terms of the bigger picture, yes, deployment is probably that area that is most ripe. Again, going back to a, for another food pun, it's the most ripe for uh, opportunity in terms of what are the tools that we can build. And I think Nime can potentially play a big, a big part in that, too. Yeah, we have now, for example, also the integrated deployment was built to extract this part of the workflow that you exactly want to reproduce in deployment. Yeah, because it's a, one of the many issues is exactly that you move things around and then uh, you don't copy them exactly or you don't reproduce them exactly and then it doesn't work on deployment. Exactly. But, so uh, to keep, let's talk again about the complicated uh, part of our job. So sometimes yeah. mistakes are also good uh, because we can learn, right? That there are these, these mistakes that you make once and then you forever will remember and then you're going to be better at that. So tell us about the biggest mistake you have learned from. That's a great question. And, and you know, as any data scientist, you know, uh, would hopefully admit is that, you know, mistakes are a part of the job. Um, you know, th there's, a, there's a statistic that gets thrown around a lot that says 87% uh, of data science projects never make it to production. So that's a big indication of a lot of mistakes being made somewhere, but you can you have to learn from your mistakes. And as a business, the way that I interact with our customers is that I tell them, you need to look at business almost as a science experiment, right? And like any science experiment, the key to any scientist's job is data, right? That's how they're able to prove their hypotheses. That's how they're able to, uh, to, 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 to gain knowledge and bring new knowledge into the world. And a business is no different. It, it is a contained experiment, in my opinion. And what the mistake that I have personally made early on in my career is to assume that data, at least data analytics, was easy, that you can make it easy. And it unfortunately, it is not, right? And Low code tools like NIME make it much, much easier, much, much accessible. But I think that it requires uh, a certain unique way of thinking and of looking at the world um, to really be good and comfortable in, uh, you know, n extracting value and insights out of data. So that's why our data scientists um, are so good at what they do. They have been doing this for years and they bring that sort of curious scientists mindset to the problems that they're trying to solve. It's, that's why we call it data science, right? Because it is a science. Um, but it, I, I personally feel that is a mistake to make it appear as, as, as if it could be as if anybody can do it, as if it's just the simplest thing in the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think everyone can contribute. I think everyone can add to the data value chain. I just think that um, there will always be a need 
for data experts. There will always be a need for people who bring that level of expertise uh, and comfort and knowledge in working with data. Um, and so that's part of our mission, right, is again, to democratize data science, but organizations really need to do a, a better job at identifying those people in their organizations that have that potential, right? And, and, some, and it, it, sometimes it doesn't matter what you studied, where you went to school, you know, what your degree was in. Uh, it's really about how you tackle problems. How do you solve problems? And do you enjoy it, right? That's, I think, the, the, the rarest part, right? It's finding people who actually like to wrangle data and spend hours and hours just fighting with it until you, you, you submit it and it gives you the information and the insights that, that you're seeking. So uh, I think there's a lot that can be done there. I think there are untapped resources in organizations. Myself, um, coming from an underrepresented group, I see potential in a lot of people. And, and, and that's also one of our mission at, at Haystack Data Solutions is bringing and giving opportunities to other data scientists of color like myself uh, you know, to, 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 to tap into, you know, their skills and their creativity and their unique perspectives, because we all bring our own unique perspectives to, to the work that we do. So I think, I think companies can do a lot to, to tap into, uh, these resources to, 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 to really grow and, and expand their, their, their capabilities. I do agree with that. Um, I think NIME removes the barrier of programming, sure, so it's easier, but still you need a mindset that is the data mindset, right, to exactly. uh, perform the, the right operations and to find the solution to the problem. Exactly. So, but you talked about business, right? And so I know that you are a data scientist, but at the same time, you're also a businessman. So let's mm -hmm. talk about money and time. Um, so how significant is the impact of data analytics in a business? Uh, what are the um, some immediate impacts that you have witnessed in your experience? That's a great question. And, you know, obviously I'm, I'm a bit biased uh, with, with my answer, given that we provide data science solutions to to companies in the food sector, uh, but I, you know, I am I consider myself a, a data science evangelist first and foremost, uh, because I have seen firsthand the impact that data analytics and data science, data engineering, can have on an organization. Um, it is, as I mentioned before, it is really about ex you know developing your knowledge, your your enterprise knowledge, as as we call it. And to take on that sort of experimental approach, that iterative experimental approach to any sort of project that you tackle. And a lot of organizations, you know, they have almost unrealistic expectations initially of mm -hmm. what data science can do. And I always find that I have to sort of tamper or temper those, those expectations a little bit and say, look, this is not a crystal ball. This is a process. This is going to be, you know, uh, uh, you know, for for the rest of your existence, you're, you know, as a business, as an organization, you're going to need to build and continually build your skills organizationally uh, to get value out of your data. But there's no denying, and 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 I hate to use this term because it's been used so 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 much, but you know, data is the new oil, right? And data is not going to go away. It's, it's, it's expanding exponentially every year. And, um, you know, we just don't have enough human brains to process all the data that is being generated today, not just by, uh, you know, standard human processes, but by machines. <laughs> We've got machines that are just generating, uh, you know, millions and millions of, of, of data points uh, on an hourly basis. So, you know, I feel that, you know, you cannot do enough as an organization or to, 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 you know, th there's always more that you can do. There's always more analysis that can be made. There's always more insights that can be, that can be gained. There's always more value that you can extract. You can monetize data. You can, uh, you know, reduce costs through data. You can optimize through data, drive efficiency. Uh, all of these things make you as an organization stronger and faster and better at what you do. So it's a competitive advantage. So yes, as I said, I, I am biased, but I feel like the need for these skills, the need for these capabilities is only going to increase uh, well into the future. And I feel that 
no code and low code tools like NIME are going to be one of those key drivers. Because as you said, Rosaria, the coding has been uh, an obstacle for most people. It, it takes very long to master a programming language. Um, and oftentimes the amount of time that it takes to produce anything of any real value, you know, it's, you know, the company's already moved on. You know, you have to operate at the speed of business. And, you know, yeah. software is, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I'm a programmer myself. Uh, I, that's how I started in the data space, uh, programming in, in, in languages like R and Python. Um, but business moves so fast. And today it's moving even faster. Tomorrow is going to move even faster still. So how can you analyze and provide those types of insights at the speed of business? And I think that no code is definitely going to play the, a pivotal part uh, in doing that. Yeah, and also, as you said, to manage unrealistic expectations, right? It's not that it's not possible. It's that by the time that you take to implement whatever solution, maybe it takes too much time and it's already too late. Exactly. So, yeah, absolutely. I, I see I see your point. Uh, so I'll, I'll ask one question, one, last, one more question, and then we'll ask uh, Roberto, as usual, if there are questions from the audience. So uh, the last question is uh, uh, about your awards. <laughs> so I saw that you were recently named the winner uh, of the LinkedIn Creator Accelerator Program. So how will this award help you grow your voice as a thought leader in data science for the food industry? And then I also saw that Haystack, uh, won a Best in Baking Award at the IBIE in Las Vegas uh, for data automation. So tell us more about that. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so, yes, I did win uh, recently, just this week, actually announced that I was one of the recipients of the LinkedIn Accelerator Program. Uh, it is a, a unique program that LinkedIn is doing where they are actually supporting uh, creators on the platform to, to really grow their voices, build their communities. And as a sort of part-time creator myself, uh, I am uh, incredibly happy about having been selected into this, this very small group. It's only 120 creators were selected, thousands of applications were received, and this program is gonna help me uh, build my thought leadership. It's gonna help me produce content uh, that hopefully people will wanna read. Uh, you know, will want to consume videos, and and, and I, I have plans to make some training videos around NIME um, that will help people embrace low-code data science. Um, and so I'm really, really, really excited excited to get started on on building some of this content. Uh, where, you know, some of the challenges, obviously, is um, you know, how do you make, how do you, you know, people love chocolate. They don't necessarily mm -hmm. like broccoli, right? And, <laughs> and 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 unfortunately, data science and statistics and these types of things kind of fall more into the broccoli side. <laughs> but how can you how can you uh, you know how can you add a little bit more chocolate to your broccoli and make it you know <laughs> and, and, and you know so that's going to be my challenge. Hopefully, I can I can figure out that puzzle. But I'm excited I'm excited to try. Um, but and then the IBIE the that's the International uh, Baking Industry Expo. It is the largest baking industry expo in the Western Hemisphere that took place a couple of weeks ago uh, in Las Vegas. Uh, it, it's it's almost like the Olympics for baking. It happens only every three years. And I was surprised and ecstatic to find that Haystack was uh, named a winner in the best in baking category for, for, for robotics and data automation. Um, so we do work with a number of, as I said, industrial bakers and, you know, grain millers and, and these types of organizations, um, helping them with their data. And that sort of analytics process automation uh, is a big part of what we do. And, and, and so uh, I, I am just so happy, you know, that uh, we're getting this recognition and we hope to have a, a, an even bigger impact in the food industry going forward. So extremely honored and uh, humbled and excited by it all. So thank you. Congratulations. It's Thank one you. great award after the next. Unbelievable. <laughs> it's been it's been a it's been a, a good couple of months for us. So I'm, I'm, I'm very <laughs> An happy. Exciting time. Yeah, I see. Uh, okay, so let's ask, uh, let's call in Roberto. Roberto, do we have questions from the audience? Hello, everybody, and uh thank you very much, uh Pedro, for being our guest and my data guest. Uh Absolutely. it's been great to listen to uh, your conversation, guys. 
And uh, I do have actually a, a few questions. Um, so one question is that I was, uh, I was very interested about the, the discussion about the importance of having expert uh, data scientist or expert uh, uh, professional in the field. And, uh, you know, you have a, on, on hashtag on the website, you have a, a blog, The Needle, that is, uh, so I recommend everybody to go visit it because there is a lot of great content, especially uh, uh, connected to uh, the food analytics or as you more correctly define it as a food science. And um, so, and so you actually are an expert in this, uh, in this area of analytics. And I want to ask you, because you also mentioned the importance of providing opportunity to uh, minority groups that can be also part of the data analytics world. Uh, how important it is, in your opinion, mentorship, especially for young data scientists that are uh, uh, in the, maybe listening to us right now? I, I love that question, Roberto. Th thank you for, for asking that. And I, you know, I, I am extremely passionate about building the next generation of data leaders, as I like to, to say, right? I think we have uh, a hugely untapped uh, uh, wealth of talent that unfortunately goes under the radar in the world of technology and, and so on. And I, uh, you know, speaking from personal experience and my own personal background, um, you know, I come from an underrepresented group. I did not have access to a lot of the resources um, that I probably uh, should have had growing up, and uh, it was a challenge. But um, you know, I, I took on the challenge, and, and I feel that a STEM education has completely transformed my life and my family's life for the better. And so, I want to take that mantle and take th those lessons that I've learned and share those with other people who do not see themselves represented in technology and data science and in all of these spaces. And I want to tell them, hey, you're just as smart as anybody else. Don't let anybody tell you that you can't do this. You can do this work. You have talent and you have a unique voice. And so the goal is to get that voice out there. Uh, and, and, and my mission is to, to grow those voices. And, and I take pride that Haystack Data Solutions, we are comprised primarily by data scientists of color, women data scientists, um, technologists of all shapes and colors and backgrounds. And so I want other companies to do more of that. And I think there, if we do that, we need to, we need to tap into all of our collective knowledge as a species, right? We cannot, yeah. we don't have the luxury anymore to say only this group, you know, can do this type of work and this group cannot. We need everybody at the table and we need everybody to contribute their insights and their knowledge and their expertise. And so what does that mean for me uh, personally? I am engaged in a number of organizations here uh, in the Twin Cities where I go out and I speak to high school students, college students. I mentor, I have a number of students who I personally mentor and try to bring up in the industry. And I want everyone else who has had the fortune and, and uh, you know, to, to be in a good place in, in, in this industry to, to bring up the next generation, right? To, 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 to help everyone else behind them, um, you know, achieve more. So, and I think we will all win if we do that. Yeah, that's, that's refreshing to hear in the first place. And uh, um, I mean, making data science a more welcoming space and open and for everybody that uh, has it actually, you know, the expertise and that's what it really matters. That's, that's great. Um, and uh, um, on top of that, my what was the sort of a follow-up question uh, would be, uh, are you already a NIME certified trainer? You know so much about NIME, you know so much about data science. We have a, a NIME certified, certified program for trainers. If you're not one of, one of them yet, please apply. I, you should. I, that's a great idea. And it is on my list of things to do. I definitely want to uh, become a certified trainer. I want to go through the entire certification process from L2 to L4 and, and beyond. Um, and I think the, 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 the resources that NIME provides anyone who is interested in learning to, uh, you know, at their own pace or in, in a group setting. I know that the Fall Nine Summit that's coming up next month in, in Austin, Texas, is going to provide a number of training resources for individuals. It's I encourage everyone that's listening to attend uh, this summit. It's it's a hybrid, so it's going to be both on-site yeah. and virtual. So I encourage everyone to to, to participate. 
and, and learn hands on right from from other NIME experts, right, you know, that are going to be there. instructors are going to be there and teaching you how do you leverage this tool to to really right. maximize your, your data. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm definitely encouraged to uh, to, be, to get certified as soon as possible. It's on my right. list of, of things to do. <laughs> That's great to hear. Our education team will be super happy to have you in the in the in the list of in the podium of certified trainers. So, yeah. Thank you very much for being our guest and that's all from my side. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you everybody. Uh, thank you Roberto. Okay, so let, let's uh, we are close to the end. So I would like to ask the the two final questions. So the 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 one that uh, it's the of course the conclusive questions. Where do you see food analytics going in the next few years? It's only going to grow. I I see, you know, food manufacturers, uh, you know, food producers you know, embracing technology at a very rapid pace. I think what we've experienced through the pandemic has shown them how brittle and how delicate the food supply chain really is and and, and how threatened the food system uh, is and how important technology and data analytics especially is gonna is gonna play in solving these these many, many, many challenges that that we have. Uh, feeding the world. So I I see the need for digital skills to be a, an absolute urgent and dire need for not just the food industry, but every industry uh, out there, but especially the food industry. And then one last question. How can people in the audience get in contact with you? Sure, absolutely. You can find uh, us on our website, haystackdata.com. Uh, you can also find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm very active on the platform where I also have uh, our a link to our newsletter called the Haywire Food Intelligence News. Uh, and the purpose of the newsletter is to get, you know, share uh, trending topics and tips in data analytics and for the food industry. So, yes, please feel free. I'm happy to connect uh, with any and all listeners and answer any questions anyone has. Perfect. So before closing, uh, I would like to spend a couple of words on the next My Data Guest episode in November because it's special. In November, we will not have just one guest. Uh, we will have many guests. Um, uh, so indeed, I'm planning to go incognito to the Nine Fold Summit in Austin and to interview the Nine users walking to the COTM award ceremony on November 14th. Uh, so it will be like it will be like interviewing the nine stars on the red carpet, or, or or maybe I should say the nine stars on the nine yellow carpet. Uh, so who will I meet there? What who, what will they tell me? Well, if you want to know, follow me in the new adventure on the yellow carpet in November. Um, so and with this, uh, we conclude our interview. Uh, thank you, Pedro, uh, for the great conversation, for the insights on food science and uh, on how low code can help. Um, thank you also for the audience for staying with us for this interview as well. And uh, see you all at the Yellow Carpet episode during the Nine Fold Summit in Austin in November. Thank you, Rosaria. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.